Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, give everyone a few more minutes before we begin. Mark, does everything look good from your side? Audio, video, content. Yep, looks everything looks good. I see your uh, what you're sharing. Yep, we're rocking and rolling. Okay. You can see me as well, my video. Yep, you look good, man. Excellent. I don't know if I look good, but at least I'm on video, so we'll do that. All right. All right, at the top of the hour, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of people jumping in. Um, Mark, I think you'll just keep letting people in. I'll, I'll kind of get us kicked off. Uh, looks like we've got a fair amount of people already in the meeting, which is great. Uh, this meeting is going to be recorded. Uh, we will hand off the, uh, the, the content and everything at the end of this meeting. It'll be located on our uh, web page. We'll have more information kind of at the end of the presentation for this. Um, so to kick things off, um, welcome everybody. My name's Andrew Klemek. I'm with Cyber Advisors. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Cyber Advisors, I'll give you a brief synopsis of us. Uh, we provide customized professional IT services, MSP security solutions uh, to over 3,000 clients. Uh, we operate out of the headquarters in Maple Grove, Minnesota as well as two additional offices, one in Burnsville and uh, Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, also, we have uh, remote workers in over 20 plus states at this time, kind of serving the small, medium, uh, mid-market and enterprise clients across the country. So we offer everything from managed services, security services, such as offensive, defensive or compliance management, networking, as well as cloud and modern work, um, such as advisory services or implementations um, with, with all the solutions that we offer. Today, we're going to focus um, primarily around those cloud, that modern workplace um, solution set from Microsoft and what it can do to help uh, organizations. Um, I myself have been here at Cyber Advisors uh, going on 12 years uh, this spring or next spring already, and I helped lead our cloud and modern work practice. Over that time, I've worked very closely on a number of different Microsoft and cloud-centric capabilities and solutions um, as the ecosystem has grown over time. Uh, prior to my consulting days, I actually worked directly with Microsoft on a number of their budding cloud divisions, uh, both with the Office and Dynamics teams, uh, located in Fargo, North Dakota at the time. Uh, this was long enough ago that before they called it Microsoft 365 or Office 365, they had another term. Um, people that have been utilizing these services for a long time might recall this, but it was the Business Productivity Online Suite, or BPOS for short, not very catchy. Um, so they changed it pretty quickly. Um, to Office 365, but we could kind of see that initial growth internally at Microsoft, what they were trying to build um, was that cloud-centric ecosystem for organizations. And now they're taking that ecosystem and they're constantly improving it and not only adding new features over time, but the security and governance controls that organizations not only need, they're, they're asking for. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on. 
Um, I do want to mention that even though October is almost done with already, uh, it is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, this was created uh, back in 2004 by then President and Congress to, to raise awareness about the importance of cybersecurity and the increasing threats posed by cyber criminals. So with the rise of AI, threat actors are using more sophisticated tactics to target individuals and businesses alike. So it's, a, it's important to educate yourself and to take proactive measures to protect your personal data and business information from these evolving threats. So what are we here to talk about? It's data and data security. So data has become the lifeblood of every business. It's predicted that the data sphere or the amount of data that's in the world will double by 2026. So it means that data is everywhere and it's exponentially growing. So today, data usage has moved beyond the traditional borders of business. It's now being stored on premise in multiple clouds on multiple devices and access from outside, uh, both internally and outside the corporate networks. In fact, more than 90% of organizations are adopting a multiple cloud infrastructure platform or services to be able to run their businesses appropriately. With this growth in data, data security incidents are widespread and insiders actually account for a big part of those incidents, costing organizations millions of dollars every year to resolve. And with the rapid adoption and implementation of generative AI, uh, which is acting on and generating new data at a rapid rate um, you know, from those various apps, it's coming to the forefront very quickly, especially as these new risks with AI apps are not fully known yet. Although essential for many customers, securing their data is a complex, multifaceted undertaking. These challenges we're facing in securing our data is not limited to organizations alone. As many of you are likely aware, we've had a number of public sector breaches where most individuals located within the US, Canada, and even the UK have had private information such as social security numbers exposed recently um, within the past year. This is forcing both users and businesses to adopt methods of securing that data better, which is easier said than accomplished. Not only is the data and the data sources growing, but sort of the challenges in securing that data. But not all data needs the same kind of protection. Without an understanding of what data you have, blindly applying broad policies is not a proactive solution. It's estimated that nearly 30% of the decision makers don't know where or what their sensitive data is, and it's lacking full visibility into their data estate. Organizations often use multiple solutions to secure their data leading to fragmented um, solutions that are implemented that are difficult to manage and maintain. Many organizations may not even know where all their data is because there's limited restrictions or monitoring on the user actions. So you may have users storing data in Dropbox, Box, ShareFile knowingly, or you might unknowingly be storing data somewhere such as Adobe Cloud and not know it's there. And consequently, the organization may not know it's there either. So fragmented solutions result in unnecessary data transfers, duplicate copies, inconsistent data classification, redundant alerts, siloed investigation, exposure gaps, and um, a myriad of different things. So to overcome these challenges, organizations need to adopt a comprehensive approach that integrates different security solutions into a single platform to achieve a holistic view of their data and their security posture. And since data doesn't move itself, people move the data, it's important to understand how that data is being used and shared in your organization. An example of this it might be okay for a user in finance to use financial protections and revenue information, but a user within the marketing team should not. And since every organization has different types of data, different types of users, 
and they want to achieve different outcomes, there's no one-size-fits-all strategy. Over the last decade or so, we've seen a digital transformation journeys with cloud adoption. Similarly, we are now seeing customers look at generative AI in the same way to drive their next wave of innovation and its uncharted territory. Generative AI ecosystem is quickly growing, which includes not only vendor provided apps, both enterprise such as Copilot and consumer such as ChatGPT, but there will soon be a significant growth in generative AI apps that the organization will build on AI platforms such as OpenAI uh, or Azure OpenAI or ChatGPT. According to Gartner, less than half of the CIOs and tech leaders say that they're confident that their organization um, has the security processes in place to mitigate the risk of AI. Moreover, we know regulatory requirements will continue to evolve. It's expected within the next three years, at least one global company will see its AI deployment banned by regulators for non-compliance, data protection, or AI governance legislation. So how can organizations get ahead of their data security challenges? They need to understand hidden risks to their data. And this starts with getting visibility into what data you have, where it's located, how your users are interacting with that data, and what activities are happening in your organization. Without this visibility, you will not be able to effectively protect that data. Once you have that visibility into the data risks, you can implement multiple layers of control. Um, you need to combine that data context with the user context so you can create that effective data loss prevention policies across the digital landscape. Remember, there's no one size fits all, and that applies to your DLP policies also. We hear from customers that they may scope their policy, their DLP policies to most users and therefore only run them in audit mode. And since we don't want to, you know, because we don't want to impede on that pro productivity. Such a strategy then prevents the organization from being truly proactive and keeps them in a reactionary stage when an event or an incident occurs. And finally, when data security incidents happen, you need to be able to quickly investigate and remediate the incident and put policies in place to prevent similar incidents from happening again in the future. So what does this all mean? It means organizations worldwide are facing the same challenges. Their employees are overburdened, spending too much time on routine tasks. The complexity of managing endpoints, such as workstations, iPads, mobile devices. Leadership is concerned about unintentional data exfiltration due to lack of governance controls. External threats could pose a risk to the organization and IT budgets ballooning out of control. Far too often, we see organizations purchase a new solution, thinking that this will end their security concerns, only to realize months later that it did not. Everything's expensive, and it can be very costly to organizations if they choose a solution that's too niche or limited in the capabilities to properly protect their users and their data effectively. So this all sounds like a tall task, but there is a pathway to get there. And do not worry, you are not alone in this journey. Um, many organizations and individuals are in the same situation today. So once you understand how you can help your organization become cyber smart, it makes it easier to work towards those goals. Now, most of you have all heard different ways to protect against threats uh, because they've been said time and time again over many, many years. You know, being skeptical of malicious links, phishing emails, phishing texts, which I'm sure everyone like myself gets all the time. Um, when you receive these, especially when they're out of the blue or from individuals that you do not know, you want to be skeptical of those. You want to be suspicious um, and wonder who this is. Do I know this person? Should I be clicking or opening up those attachments? You know, safeguarding yourself against messages that do include attachments. This is one of the 
easiest ways organizations can become compromised from an email message that may look legitimate. They'll open the attachment. It may have a malicious script that automatically runs on the machine and exfiltrates credentials. Or ensuring that you're not oversharing personal information or passwords unless it's necessary to do so, then do so in real time. Meaning pick up the phone, verify that the person you're speaking with, um, that you know who, uh, the that they're the correct person that you should be giving that information to. And by making stronger passwords, utilizing a password manager or go passwordless, or use an authenticator app or biometrics. The National Institute of Standards and Technologies, or NIST, now recommends having a password length of at least 15 characters or more. Ensuring that software updates and vulnerabilities are patched frequently and often. So many of these things we've heard for several years. However, one item that is quickly creating a new landscape of security concerns for organizations is AI. We'll get to this in a second, on how you can safely use AI. So Microsoft has created an ecosystem that allows people to, to collaborate, communicate, and allow businesses to operate effectively. And they've been doing this for decades. So what's changed? They have all the collaborative apps that are still there, but now Microsoft has built that security ecosystem on top to, to help govern, protect, mitigate, and secure your users, your apps, and your data. And you have a pathway that allows you to grow into a more secure state. Remember, security is all about your risk and how you manage that risk. And this isn't a holistic view of all the capabilities that are at your fingertips within Microsoft 365, but these are some of the critical tools and services that you can better understand of what these can do for you in your environment. Below, each one of these sections are individual licensing SKUs that you need for these different areas. But keep in mind that many of these features are already bundled into different um, SKUs, such as the business and enterprise uh, SKUs, like Business Premium, Microsoft E3, and E5 licensing um, that you may already have for many of your users. So to start off, how do you govern access? When a user logs into 365, they do so with a single managed corporate identity. Entre ID automatically evaluates that login using conditional access rules. These rules that you set take into account factors such as the user, group membership, IP location, device state, and applications that are being accessed at that time. It monitors and controls the access in real time, and if a problem is detected, it can prompt the user to reset their password or even block access entirely. So if we have a user, let's call her Jen for a moment, and she's logging into her PC in her office at Minnesota one morning, and she starts working within Teams, Outlook, maybe some Word or Excel documents. On the back end of those applications, Microsoft has already done the authentication for Jen, and Jen may not even be aware of it, depending on the parameters that were set. So if Jen's credentials are compromised and the threat actor tries to log in as Jen and they're coming from a different location, Microsoft Entra ID has safeguards built in to say that it's impossible to travel when Jen is located in Minnesota. She can't also be logged into these 365 services from a different IP address out of Russia or China. Microsoft also uses Continuous Access Evaluation, or CAE, which monitors critical events and issues access tokens that can be revoked immediately if there's a change to the user account or policy. So this covers situations like you know, user termination, password changes, resets, network location changes, uh, and token revocation. This process ensures that the latest security policies are enforced immediately without depending on token expiration, which is reducing the risk of unauthorized access. Once they're logged in, the user can then access apps such as Word, Excel, Outlook, PowerPoint, Teams, and more. The endpoint management features in Intune ensure that these apps are securely installed and up to date on the user's devices. 
So depending on your organization's policies, you can limit the use of work apps, including Copilot on personal devices to prevent data leakage, or the use of unsecured or unmanaged devices. Alternatively, if your organization can implement app protection policies to limit user actions, you can take on these devices, such as saving generative files, unsecured apps, or restricting copy and paste to non-approved work applications. And with Intune, all work content, including any content that may be generated from Copilot, can be wiped if the device is lost or disassociated with the company remotely. And if this happen, and all of this can happen in the background, just when the user is logging in. For the third item, even when using a corporate managed device like Windows 11 or a managed work profile on an Android phone, we should always assume breach and take proactive measures against malicious actors that abuse email, web, and other forms of cyber attacks. Remember, proactive defense is about reducing that attack surface, meaning limiting the area of opportunity for an attacker. So in case a user receives emails with malicious files, Defender for Office will review and detonate all attachments or links the email, in the email in a virtual sandbox. And it speeds up that internal clock thousands of years and identifies if there's anything malicious uh, or any activity that will happen from the attachments or links before it's delivered to the end user safely. <laughs> let's take that one layer uh, further. Now let's say a malicious attachment still gets through to the end user. You could have Defender for Endpoint, the antivirus and endpoint detection and response or EDR service that can act when that file is opened. It can then clean, prevent, or remediate issues on the device. Or what if an unknown or untrusted app already on the machine tries to access sensitive folders or files on the device? You can have controlled folder access policies that can block this action. So you could think of all these security capabilities as just layers on an onion. You want to natively layer on security on the critical services, functions, and data that your organization needs to protect. All of these settings are to help prevent the threat actors from getting your sensitive data. But what about the capabilities to prevent data from leaking outside of your organization? So with Microsoft 365, it's easier to discover and classify your sensitive data that resides within your environment. Once you know your data, you can benefit from using our built-in labeling and protection experiences in your core productivity solutions. Apps like Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, services like SharePoint, Exchange, or Power BI. Use these work core workloads instead of a bolted on or plug-in experience. This allows you to audit your classified data as well as encrypting or restricting certain types of data from both internal and external threats. I mean, you can identify if there's a certain set of users internally that you want to be allowed access to sensitive um, or private company information, um, as well as protecting it against external individuals from accidentally oversharing or accessing that information that you don't want uh, for an audience. Once that sensitive data is classified, you can establish a protection plan to address the risks of accidental or inappropriate sharing of sensitive content across applications, services, and tools your users use every day. As part of information protection solution, data loss prevention also provides a consistent set of policies and actions across email and files. So these capabilities are enforced or enforce information protection policies in a way that's consistent, fully transparent, and auditable. The fifth way in securing your organization is ensuring the secure use of websites, including generative AI services. So Defender for Endpoint P1 web protection allows for the configuration of blocking specific URLs, which could potentially be used to block access to unsanctioned uh, applications or web AI services. 
Let's say a user is trying to browse a link that may be a dangerous domain. Microsoft Cloud uh, Access Security can use web and network protections to prevent or protect the user from accessing these dangerous domains. This can be useful in scenarios for organizations that want to restrict AI services um, that their users may be authorized or unauthorized to use. So even if the domain may not be dangerous, um, if the organization identifies a risk and they don't want that data to accidentally go into an AI service, uh, then you can have strong policies and protections um, to prevent that and allow only your users to access authorized websites. In here that you'll notice under the discovered apps, Netflix may be one that's uh, not necessarily dangerous, but you don't want your users accessing this during work, uh, you know, official work hours. You can unsanction that, similar to a dangerous domain. And then it's just not available. Finally, let's discuss the recent addition that many organizational ecosystems uh, that's causing concern, which is AI services. So remember that AI section when we were trying to be cyber smart at the beginning of the presentation? It's by far the fastest service that organizations are concerned with. The good thing is that all of these services that we just touched on can help your organization be more secure with their users and data, including being more secure with AI. 78% of users are already bringing their own AI tools to work. The BYOAI acronym, uh, even though it's more, it's already more common for the medium uh, and small uh, size companies, uh, according to the Work Trend Index. So it's very prevalent already, and organizations are concerned on how to protect and prevent unauthorized access or accidental sense of information leaking out to services that should not be approved. So why is this important? These tools that we covered can help secure both your usage, your AI usage in your environment, and rather than bolting on additional services to monitor, manage, or audit usage, you can use the existing ecosystem. So Microsoft has its own built-in generative AI service within Microsoft 365 called Copilot. It allows individuals to interact with the, their data and it uses your existing data security and compliance policies that are in place for governance protection. So Copilot will only access the data the user has permissions to view. If, if the user doesn't have access to certain files, Copilot will not process or provide that information. If Copilot generates sensitive data that's saved in 365 locations, Data loss prevention policies are automatically activated to prevent data exfiltration. And all interactions are logged for auditing purposes. And any business or code of conduct violations can be automatically detected for quick corrective actions. You can also enable retention policies to ensure that data is not kept longer than absolutely necessary. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what if your organization's not using Copilot? But what's preventing them from using other AI services with your data today? This is where those governing controls that Microsoft has built in to prevent data loss that can be applied to users, data, Copilot, as well as other non-Microsoft related services with web protection. Or if you simply want to start using Copilot as your AI solution, but you're not ready to audit permissions and configure information protection or data loss prevention policies to secure your data, you can temp temporarily restrict Copilot from accessing your SharePoint data, including OneDrive, or select only the sites that you have reviewed and approved for it to utilize. So this concludes a brief introduction to the different security and compliance solutions that Microsoft has built into their ecosystem for businesses to take advantage of. They offer a comprehensive portfolio that allows the, any size organization to implement an end-to-end -end zero trust strategy. For a deeper dive, the next session in November, we'll be focusing more on Microsoft purview information protection and data loss prevention. 
In December, session will be focused on how to protect and monitor your organization's data when being used with Copilot and other, other generative AI solutions such as Gemini, Jasper, or ChatGPT. All attendees should automatically receive an email with the invitation to both of these upcoming events. But if you do not receive a link, all the events will be posted on our cyberadvisors.com blog page, as well as content from this presentation. We'll also be including recaps from the recent MMS conference and the upcoming Microsoft Ignite conferences and what new and exciting things are going to be announced. I do also want to mention uh, that many individuals and organizations may have existing perpetual or volume licensed products that are reaching an end of support life cycle next October, so 2025. If you have any of these um, in your current portfolio, here's your current available options and recommended upgrade or replacement solution path. Typically, Microsoft offers that 10-year support model, which we're used to on perpetual licensing. However, many of the 2019 solutions are now ending at the same time as their 2016 counterparts. So there's options um, to still remain on premise if your organization has requirements to do so with supported software. So thank you for all attending today. If you have questions or anything discussed uh, you know, through any of the slides, please feel free to ask a question in chat. Otherwise, you can certainly reach out to sales at cyberadvisors.com um, for more information on today's webinar or on any of the other professional services that we do offer on the screen. Uh, Mark and I will stick around for a few minutes if there are questions in chat that we can help answer. Um, but I appreciate everyone attending. So do you have any advice for people who perhaps will not accept AI just because of the fear or danger? Yes, um, absolutely. So the the acceptance of AI is, is, is going to be really tricky for a lot of organizations. That's why there's more than one solution. And we're, I'm, you know, I'm trying to pr um, encourage organizations to, even if they're against it, to understand what their options are, because it's it is going to be somewhat of a tidal wave that's coming, and even if you're not ready for it at this time to take advantage or to provide access to those generative AI solutions, um, you still want to be able to protect that data. Um, we're seeing a huge trend of data that's just going to any AI service because there's there's so many that are being built. Um, when we first when Microsoft first started rolling out their AI hub, which is still in preview in a lot of uh, tenants. It went from 10 to 12 services to over 400 in like the first three days of existing because there's, the, the, there's that many um, AI solutions out there that are constantly growing. So if there's an opportunity to, you know, kind of batten down the hatches a little bit until the organization feels more comfortable with AI, you definitely want to try and protect yourself, um, your users or that data, because if there's an option to make something more effective um, with AI, your end users are going to try and naturally gravitate to those solutions. Um, I will say that the presentation that we'll be doing in December is going to be similar, but with updated information that we did uh, this past April uh, for one of our in-person workshops on Copilot and AI. So we will be diving deeper into that um, to give a little bit more detail as far as how, if you are interested in utilizing AI services or getting your organization users to adopt it, what you can do, what you can look for. Um, if you're looking for information before that, Look at, I think it's aka.ms slash copilot lab or copilot labs. There's a ton of information um, for use case scenarios, what you can do, and it's and it can be broken down by different industry types as well as different sectors within, within the organization like marketing, sales, finance. Um, so different department teams that and, and ways that they can help use AI services to become more effective in their everyday um, uh, usage. Um, do you have any advice for newbie transitioning to cyberspace 
for internship remotely? Um, I, I would say definitely become more familiar with AI services, but security and data security um, services are, are widespread. Um, I've been doing this for over 20 years already, and we've seen uh, you know, def definite uh, or, or unique situations that come along periodically that automatically, uh, you know, kind of, you know, organizations gravitate to. Virtualization was one of them in the early 2000s that everybody had to stay on a, you know, physical servers, one physical server for each of their applications and everything. And then this this wave of virtualization took over and if and there was a lot of benefits to it now it's seen seen as an afterthought because now people are moving to the cloud um and in the next the the new big wave and there's some reasons behind why data security um, is becoming the new big wave is a lot of legislation so the eu for example has had gdpr and other um you know requirements for organizations as far as their data protection goes for a number of years the us unless you're in an industry that is highly regulated um, you typically do not have a ton of regulations or requirements for data protection that's changing and i imagine it's going to start changing even faster with the generative ai solutions that are coming out there um, California already has their own, you know, California GDPR subset. I think other states are going to likely adopt similar fashions for data protection because organizations um, right now are just generally not doing enough to protect that data. And for the amount of breaches and data loss that we're seeing on a daily basis now, um, legislation is going to likely step in and be a little bit more forceful um it we were already seeing it from small businesses that do business with other vendors and clients that are larger enterprise um, i can think of a few that say they they sell to target for example well target is a big um you know, enterprise organization, they have a lot of policies and practice and data protection in place, especially after they were breached several years ago, but they pushed those policies down to their small mom and pop manufacturers now. So even these, you know, 10, you know, five to 10 person organizations have to now adopt these large data protection policies. And it's putting a lot of strain on organizations, both big and small. Um, I hope that answers your question a little bit in terms of if any advice for <laughs> where you should be uh, maybe focusing. Uh, the only way to get those reluct uh, the only way to get these reluctant uh, to accept AI through education, showing showing them the uses where AI can help conversely educate them on how AI could be used for bad and what to look out for. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's there's a good and bad and there, there's a lot of good things that can happen um, with AI services. But there's a lot of bad things too. Uh, one, one of the good things is that people, a lot of programmers are taking the opportunity to build things that have been frustrating for um, <laughs> just individuals over time. One that I recently saw <laughs> was a, uh, a programmer took it upon herself to create an AI service dedicated to helping with insurance disputes and claims automatically uh, because the healthcare industry is very kind of complex and convoluted and to have any like payment disputes and everything is a is a crazy um, situation that you have to sometimes navigate to have any type of resolution but you're getting these you know great individuals that um, understand how to use ai and they're creating these solutions that help the individuals be able to you know better process these for next to nothing now so rather than you know where it would previously take you know attorneys and everything to maybe fight these disputes um, now they're creating automated solutions to automatically fill out the paperwork get you on the right path and moving forward uh, for some of these claims so there's a lot of good that can come out of this um, but conversely with the amount of capabilities that it has there's threat actors that are already doing it um, I've seen 
where you know there's um, impersonation attempts that are very hard to distinguish. Um, there's been you know f phone impersonations where it sounds like you know it could sound like your accounting uh, individual or your CEO or CIO, and they're asking you to do something over the phone. It sounds like them, and they may have enough information to basically um, convince you that it is them to somehow socially engineer their way into getting credentials or information such as bank, um, you know, banking or financial information out of you, and you'll have no idea that it was not them. So, again, be skeptical of things that are being asked of you. If it doesn't sound right, you know, meet with that individual. Don't, you know, don't jump on the first thing that you see when there's, uh, you know, if someone's asking you to, if your CEO is asking you to wire transfer money to this different bank account, like, that's that's happening far too frequently. And it's only going to get worse um, with the new technology. So it, it's, it's a constant cat and mouse game to stay ahead of the threat actors. Uh, to break into cybersecurity without experience and maybe only certifications is hard, but not impossible. Networking is going to be your best way to get your foot into the door. Try volunteering for organizations. You will meet people that you may know, someone in the industry, a personal introduction uh, will get you past the ATS resume. Weed out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. I mean, cybersecurity is a huge um huge industry and it's only going to continue to grow one of the i don't even know what microsoft's up to anymore the last i heard so they were the the biggest um security um organization uh in the world because at the time they had over five thousand security dedicated security engineers i'm sure it's you know well past that now um but they're definitely spending a lot of money and a lot of organizations are uh, being able to have you know, you know a, a, not just a solid understanding of what um, you need to do from an individual standpoint, but from an organizational standpoint as it relates to, you know, any obligations or regulatory requirements that you have. Um, but how to actually implement those are, can be two different things. Um, so we have like an entire security practice here at Cyber Advisors that we do everything from offensive like pen testing, um, and vulnerability assessments to defensive and you know compliance GRC auditing because there's so many different variations of security that you can get into, and then there's the whole implementing security side. Um, so there's there's kind of there's four different sections of it, and it's really um, quickly growing and quickly evolving. That there's you know if you have interest in offensive defensive implementation or auditing uh, you know you can you can pick what you what you favor and go down that avenue uh, questions though uh mark did i miss any questions nope he covered it all andrew okay here's another one Interning depends on where you are in life. If you are a student or transitioning to military member, military spouse, there are programs. Yeah, a absolutely. Lots of military um, programs. Our military is highly focused on security. A lot of our um, offensive and defensive engineers that we have on staff have a military background and everything. Um, they have a lot of different programs that can get you started on that. Uh, if not, then you don't need an internship, uh, beginner job, which will add skills to move up. Yeah, I, there, there's lots of opportunities out there um, for cybersecurity. Uh, being able to, you know, do initial audits and assessments and kind of grow. Like if you're looking for more of the offensive side uh, and being able to, you know, eventually get up into like high level penetration testing and different types of pen testing as well. Um, during that um, is is you know can seem like a uh, a tall task, um, but there's definitely ways to get there quickly. And you know, getting your 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 toes wet um, into really anything security is I, I don't think that's a a bad area to get into because I don't see this um, 
you know, the, the landscape changing soon and there's going, you know, everyone's going to be, um, you know, more tightly focused on security and governance controls as they go. Um, especially I, I bet by 2027 to 2030, um, that's where the majority of, uh, the new, um, jobs are going to be coming in or probably one of the fastest growing areas of opportunity, uh, just because of new legislation that, you know, if, if I had to put a pin on something that's likely going to make some changes, we'll likely see some legislation, um, that's passed here within the next, you know, five to seven years, um, that's going to affect, um, a lot of individuals, but organizations as well, that's going to force more security and governance controls, which will create a, you know, a bigger job opportunity vacuum. How to keep up with all the rapid changes in cybersecurity? Um, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's very hard to do. There's a lot of materials out there. Um, you know, one of the, the, the first, uh, um, slides that I had posted. So the, the October, the cybersecurity awareness. So it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it was created by, um, Congress at, you know, 20 years ago, but Microsoft and NIST and a number of, uh, different organizations all kind of jumped on board. If you search for cybersecurity awareness with Microsoft, they have a, a, a tremendous, uh, website that shows, um, and, and I, I should have, I wanted to show it off in our, our slide deck, but there's so much information on that page as you scroll down. Um, it's really hard to put into like a PowerPoint presentation, um, but go through that. Um, like I said, search for cybersecurity awareness and, and Microsoft. I'm sure it'll be one of the, the, the first things uh, that pop up. That site is has a tremendous amount of information there, but NIST provides a lot of good information. There's a number of, um, you know, uh, different websites and services that can get you information on trying to stay, you know, up to date or relatively up to date with cybersecurity and the changing landscape. Uh, keep up by continuing education. Security is always changing. Stay on top of education keeps you from becoming redundant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Stating cybersecurity in turn in different ways isn't a question. Please take uh, time to type out a question. No one is going to spoon feed you. Um, yeah, there's there's so much information out there. Um, sometimes you have to start to figure out like what you're interested in because cybersecurity is a, a big area of concern. So there's more than just one item. Well, I appreciate everyone. Um, like I said, we're going to be trying to do this for the community more often. Uh, we've got one coming up in November, December. We've got some other sessions as well. Um, not everything's going to be um, quite high level. We will go into the weeds a little bit on different services and capabilities. But ultimately, like our goal is really to get this information out there because there's a lot of features and services, um, both within like Microsoft, you know, solutions, but even non Microsoft solutions that can really help to improve and, and protect organizations. Um, so we're trying to get that out to the community and, and do a better job of just educating um, our clients uh, and different organizations on what they can do, what they should be looking for, how to help prepare um, and what's out there. So thank you all.